Hello, and welcome to the Research Library Bible Study Series. This video series, titled The Revelation of Jesus Christ, presents a verse-by-verse -verse commentary on the Revelation. Part 2 of this series was an analysis of the testimonies of the Angel of the Lord to the seven churches in Asia, as found in chapters 2 and 3. Part 3 will cover John's vision of the throne and the arrival of the Lamb, as found in chapters 4 and 5. We are using the Research Library Bible Study software. A concordance keyword named Revelation Commentary was previously created to assist with the analysis. Recall that prior to chapter 4, John was in direct contact with the Angel of the Lord. The Angel of the Lord was identified as like unto the Son of Man and as the Son of God. In this verse, he is specifically identified as the angel of our Lord Jesus. And in this verse, he said he is sitting in the throne of the Father. That information will become highly relevant in chapter 4 and forward. Revelation 4 begins with this vision by John. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things, things that must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Let's analyze this phrase with Strong's Concordance. This Greek phrase is translated in the King James Version as must be hereafter. Young's literal translation renders it this way. It can also be interpreted as must come to pass after these things. Recall these earlier instructions by the angel of the Lord to John. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. These verses explain the things that John hast seen, or the seven stars and the seven candlesticks, as well as the angel of the Lord in all his glory. A likely interpretation for the things that are were the events to occur in the seven churches, as listed in chapters 2 and 3. The last clause, which contains the Greek word melo, is more accurately interpreted as the things that are about to come after these things. However, the imminence implied by the word melo found in verse 119, is missing from verse 4-1. We will assume that John was about to see visions of things that were to be fulfilled later in his future, and not events as they were being fulfilled. In other words, John was seeing the future from this point forward. The throne in verses 2 and 3 is similar to the one in Ezekiel. Round about each throne was a rainbow, and both thrones were occupied. The occupant of the throne in Ezekiel is identified as the likeness of a man with the brightness of the glory of the Lord. But who is sitting on the throne in John's vision? Recall the angel of the Lord said he was alive, and then dead, and now is alive forevermore. He that sat upon this throne also liveth forever. God is invisible. 
Jesus, or rather his angel, is the image of the invisible God. Jesus, the image of God, was already sitting in the invisible God's throne when his angel testified to the churches. Therefore, it is reasonable to assume that Jesus was the one sitting on the throne in John's vision, and Jesus is the one sitting in chapter 7, identified as God. That should not come as a great surprise, since John said Jesus is our Creator. Jesus also said, He is the Father. And David said, The Lord is God. And the Lord our God is one Lord. Thus, Jesus is the one sitting on the throne. Round about the throne were twenty-four seats occupied by twenty-four elders who were wearing crowns of gold. The same Greek word underlies both the elders' seats and the throne where Jesus was sitting. Therefore, these twenty-four elders were royal beings sitting on thrones in the vicinity of the throne of Jesus. Recall that the faithful children of Israel, those who obeyed the Lord's voice and kept his covenant, would become a kingdom of priests. Peter, quoting the Greek Old Testament, wrote of that fulfillment to the scattered tribes in Asia Minor. This embedded link will navigate to the notes for verse 1-1. This is the Greek that identifies the scattered strangers as the diaspora. The LXX identifies the faithful of Israel as the royal priesthood. But who are these 24 elders? It appears they may be the future royal priesthood, in full or in part. Half of them may be the apostles sitting on their thrones. But will they reign on the earth, or will someone else? That is to be determined. It was mentioned in chapter 1 that there were seven spirits before the throne of him that is, and was, and is to come. Those spirits appear before the throne in chapter 4 as seven lamps of fire. But what are the seven spirits? The angel of the Lord had the seven spirits when he, as the Spirit, spake to the seven churches, And there were seven separate passages from the Spirit to the churches, one to each church. In each case, the target of the Spirit, identified as he or him, was exhorted to hear what the Spirit said to all the churches. The Lamb before the throne in chapter 5 has seven eyes, which are the seven spirits sent forth into all the earth. In Zechariah it is written that the seven eyes are the eyes of the Lord that run to and fro through the whole earth. It is also written that those seven eyes are located upon a stone, which is associated with a servant named Branch. So is it possible that the Lamb of Revelation 5 is the stone foretold in Zechariah 3? For now, let us assume the seven spirits are the seven messages to the churches that were sent forth into all the earth by way of the book of Revelation. Let us also assume that the Lamb is the sole hearer or receiver of those seven spirits that were sent forth by the Lord. The next segment begins, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, 
were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. The Greek word for crystal appears one other time in the New Testament in the last chapter, where it symbolizes the clarity of the river of water of life. The word appears seven times in the Septuagint, once in Ezekiel. Recall that Ezekiel had a vision similar to John, in which the heavens opened to the throne of God. Ezekiel saw four living creatures in the midst of the throne, similar to the four beasts John saw. Ezekiel also saw coals of fire that had the appearance of lamps. In chapter 10, Ezekiel identified the four living creatures he saw by the river Chobar, or Chebar, as cherubs. The word beast is used later in the Revelation to identify enemies of the saints. Some commentators lament the KJV translation of these four as beasts rather preferring to use the Ezekiel identifiers of living creatures, as found in most modern translations, including Young's literal translation. There have been many attempts to identify the four cherubs. The exposition in the pulpit commentary lists some of the many interpretations. The last passage of chapter 4 reminds us again that Jesus, who sits on the throne, is our Creator, who lives forever. It also provides a rare glimpse of why God created all things and us. Chapter 5 begins, And I saw in the right hand of Jesus, who was sitting on the throne, a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look thereon. John had recently conversed directly with the Son of God in all his majesty. And now John is an eyewitness to the heavenly throne of Jesus in his temple, or so it seems. So, why would John be weeping? Recall from Zechariah that it is written, The branch of the Lord would build the temple of the Lord, and the branch would rule as a priest from his throne. Is that not what John is seeing? Was Jesus, who was sitting on his throne, not worthy? Were the twenty-four elders, sitting on thrones and wearing crowns of gold, unworthy? Or, perhaps the person worthy to open the seals had not yet been born. Recall that Jesus had sent his own angel to testify to the churches. The angel had identified himself as the Son of God, and his words were spirit. The spirit made seven specific promises to a he or him that, quote, overcometh. In this passage, the Spirit promised he that overcometh would receive power over the nations. Jesus had received power over the nations from God before his ascension. And in this verse, 
Jesus had already overcome and was sitting in the Father's throne. More importantly, the Spirit promised him that overcometh the right to sit with Jesus in his throne. The next passage may provide the key. It reads, And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. A careful exegesis reveals that it is highly unlikely that this lamb was Jesus. Jesus and Judah are both roots of David, but this lamb is not. Rather, he is simply of the tribe of Judah. The Greek implies this lamb is a young lamb. The word is used only in the Revelation and in this one verse in the Gospels, but never to directly identify Jesus. In the Septuagint, it is used only once to identify an individual, but an analysis of the context reveals it is referring to Jeremiah. The Greek in John's Gospel, which is used to identify Jesus, denotes a mature lamb. It does not infer a lambkin like the lamb of the Revelation. But one of the most convincing arguments against the lamb of the Revelation being Jesus may be the timing. It was reasonably established in Part 1 of this series that John saw this vision no earlier than about 60 A.D., and that the vision was for events in John's future. Why would Jesus present himself before his own throne as a slain immature lamb 30 years or more after his resurrection and ascension to this throne? In the Old Testament we find this passage which reads, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. It is almost universally accepted that the Samuel passage is referring to Jesus. But was it? Does this sound like it is referring to Jesus? And was not Jesus already the Son of God? Earlier, we mentioned the branch of the Lord with seven eyes, who was assigned to build the house of the Lord. Looking back and comparing, we see that this Lamb is the one who overcometh, as Jesus had overcame in the past. This is the one who is to receive the promises of the Spirit, and this is the one who heard and received the seven spirits. Remember the stone with seven eyes from the previous discussion in Zechariah? Our analysis suggests the lamb may be that stone. And the Lamb came and took the book out of the right hand of Jesus that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, 
the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred, and tongue, and people, and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. It is understandable that practically every commentator on the Revelation has equated the Lamb with Jesus. Matthew Henry seems to recognize a conflict, but rationalized it. Adam Clark seemed to think the act of being offered at this time was odd, which he attempted to rationalize. John Gill believed the Lamb was Jesus, but had not yet sat down in his Father's throne, even though the angel of the Lord in Revelation 3.21 seemed to disagree. Henry Alford noticed the peculiar Greek word for Lamb is inconsistent with the word used in the Gospel and Isaiah and he pointed out that the alteration appears to have been purposely made. Nevertheless, he believed the Lamb to be Jesus. Yet the grammar of one of his references, Matthew 8.18, 8, points to a past fulfillment. The phrase, is given, is more commonly translated as, has been given, or, was given. Recall that during Christ's ministry, the devil had power over the nations. But later, and before his ascension, Jesus told his disciples that he was given power over the heaven and earth. Therefore, at some time between Christ's temptation by the devil and his ascension back to the Father, Christ has reclaimed power over the nations from the devil. The Hebrews points to the time of Christ's death. Paul points to his death and resurrection. Peter considers it a past event at the time he wrote his epistle. Jesus said in his revelation that he had already sat down with his Father in his throne and that he had already received power over the nations from his Father but he was offering that power to someone else, someone who overcame. The lamb that overcame was to receive power of some sort. Is it possible that Jesus was offering to give power over the nations to someone else? That appears to be a reasonable interpretation. There is another point to consider before proceeding. This passage does not say for certain that the four cherubs and twenty-four elders would be reigning on the earth. Rather, they were simply singing a new song which could be based on the prayers of saints. This should become clearer in later videos. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor, and glory, and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven, and on the earth, and under the earth, and as such are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I, saying, Blessing, and honor, and glory, and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, 
and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth for ever and ever. These angels are mentioned in the Hebrews as an innumerable company of angels. And this verse may be explained as a prophecy of the time when every knee shall bow. This concludes Part 3 of the Revelation of Jesus Christ Commentary. The Bible study video for Chapters 6 and 7 will discuss the opening of the first seals by the Lamb. Visit the Bible Research Tools website to learn more about the Research Library Bible Study software used in this video. Thank you for watching.